Thank you very much. Um, Trace catheteric valve implantation has indeed exploded since this first uh, TAVI implant in Rouen, France in 2002 by Alain Cribier. And as has been shared by my previous speakers, TAVI in the US and in Europe now is the primary means of treating aortic stenosis. In fact, both in the US and in Europe, TAVI is more common than open AVR. It's projected that over the next 10 years, TAVI will grow fourfold. And this is reflected in the stock market as well. This is Edwards Life Sciences, one of the leading manufacturers of TAVI prosthesis, the share price over the, uh, the time period shown on the bottom. And you can see a steady upward trajectory. Now, this is not just to say that the share market has it correct. It's highly sensitive to data that's presented at forums such as this. This upward deflection here was when Partner 2 was presented, reflect showing a large population base increase. And then Danny De Vere presented concerns at Europe ECI in Paris about TAVI longevity, leading to a dip in the share price. And one of the key elements of this discussion is assessing risk. My remit is to talk to you about low risk, and I guess it's important to understand risk. This is data from about 2012 in the United States, showing that the majority of patients that the surgeons treated or low risk. The, the, the TAVI domain historically to date has been high risk and more recently intermediate risk in Europe and the US. And assessing risk is therefore critical. <coughs> and it, traditional risk scores like the Euro score, the STS score and the, and the frailty indices that have been shown are useful but limited. Both of these patients here had very similar objective indices, but clearly one uh, is different to the other. And I think it's important to appreciate that in the process of understanding risk, one can't utilise a singular scoring system such that the AHA and ACC in two, 2014 provided this more in-depth assessment of risk. And they included the traditional risk scores, at SDS, but objective domains of frailty, uh, major organ uh, compromise, and procedure-specific impediments both in TAVI and in surgery to identify true risk. Now, going through the evidence, I mean, my talk is about low risk, but it's important to see where we've come from. And, and as with all good trials, we start in the highest risk population. And this landmark paper in 2010 uh, was uh, in patients that were ineligible for surgery. These were patients with prohibitively high risk for surgery. These patients were randomised to either conventional treatment, which was tablets or balloon aortic valvuloplasty, or first generation balloon expandable TAVI. And there was a profound mortality reduction in the order of 20%. This level of mortality reduction wasn't seen in medicine for years. And this uh, transformed our understanding of aortic valve disease. Importantly and somewhat sobering, soberingly, only 50% of patients that were treated were still alive uh, at one year. So the next step was to assess how this strategy of treatment would perform in those patients who were operable, but operable with a high surgical risk. And in this study, uh, the core uh, pivotal trial, there was a one-year mortality advantage in favour of TAVI in yellow over surgical uh, aortic valve replacement. There were numerically less strokes in the TAVI-treated arm in yellow compared to surgery. And importantly, for all of us in the room, there were equivalent improvements in uh, heart failure classification and status. That's why we treat these patients. So, this was a key trial. Patients were perhaps getting a mortality advantage with TAVI over surgery. There were numerically less strokes and an equivalent degree of symptom improvement. So the next phase was to move down the risk strata to the, and the partner two trial uh, was looking, aimed to look at patients with intermediate risk. So 2,000 odd patients uh, were randomised to TAVI versus surgery in a non-inferiority trial. It met its primary endpoint, which was non-inferiority for the primary endpoint of death uh, and, uh, from any cause and disabling stroke. And other pre-specified uh, uh, secondary endpoints were interesting. Ec uh, the hemodynamics of the valve was superior in those patients who received TAVI compared to surgery. And in the pre-specified analysis for transfemoral TAVI, there was an advantage in the primary endpoint in favour of TAVI. Now, this pre-specified endpoint was driven uh, by the observation that transaortic and transapical TAVI uh, had poorer outcomes than transfemoral. So this is very provocative data indeed. 
Not somewhat unsurprisingly, surgery had a penalty of bleeding, acute kidney injury, and new onset atrial fibrillation. And so whilst these trials have been progressing, devices have been evolving, newer technologies have been adopted, uh, the techniques of implantation have been refined as with this uh, conscious sedation uh, and other methods that we've used. Imaging has been solidified so that we can identify hazards for TAVI, we can also size more appropriately, and overall the outcomes have continued to improve. So are we really ready for low-risk TAVI? And Darren showed the Notion trial, which was a study that uh, was uh, uh, presented this year at ACC, which randomised all comers to a TAVI or surgery. And in this uh, study, the STS score was, uh, you know, three low-risk patients. And out to five years, reassuringly, there was no difference in the all, in all-cause mortality, stroke, or myocardial infarction. Now, this was a selected group of patients, and these are patients. Uh, and this study was under power to assess this, but nevertheless, very provocative data. And two trials, the Edwards trial and the Medtronic trial, have completed recruitment this year and will report to definitively answer this question. And so I guess we don't know the answer until these studies are reported. Having sung the praises of TAVI, and I know that I'm in a room with probably more surgeons than cardiologists, I have to stop and perhaps remind everyone in the audience of the limitations of TAVI. And these are significant limitations that we all need to be aware of. And I'll go through these reasonably quickly, and the tone of my, my talk will change a little. As we go down in risk, we know that more patients will have bicuspid, bicuspid aortic valves. In the top here, you can see what happens when a TAVI valve is implanted in a tricuspid aortic valve. You get reasonably nice expansion and, uh, of, of the valve shown here in red. The bicuspid situation is far more complicated so that the valve doesn't expand as well. There's higher residual gradients, more paravalvular leaks, and by and large, the data with, with bicuspid valve disease with TAVI has been, um, has, been, has been suboptimal. This is a case that we treated that appeared to have trileaflet aortic valve disease on echocardiography. She was 82. She was high risk for surgery. We went on to perform TAVI, and we, this is a hot, uh, balloon uh, self-expanding valve. We've deployed this very high here in almost a horizontal position. And our final result was very acceptable with no significant gradient and no paravalvular leak. But this is not the rule for bicuspid uh, valve disease. Paravalvular leak was always uh, an issue for, uh, for, for TAVI in the initial phases. But the newer generation uh, TAVI devices have uh, rendered this not really a big issue. The rates of clinically significant paravalvular leak, moderate to severe, are very, very low, and this is particularly seen with, the, with those valves with robust skirts such as the Sapien 3 and the Lotus valve, very low rates of paravalvular leak. I don't think this is a major issue anymore. Stroke rates are low both for surgery and TAVI, but we do know that when patients undergo TAVI, if they have a brain MRI before and after, 80 to 90% of patients have new lesions on their brain MRI after TAVI. And these can be derived either from the heart itself, from the aortic valve, from the aortic arch, uh, or from the actual device itself. And the question, of course, is whether these lesions or embolizations to the brain will, in the future, uh, affect neurocognition and whether they'll have an impact on cognitive status. Now, we all, this has to obviously be offset with the inherent risks of, of cross clamping in aorta and uh, pump time. We all see patients. You know, infrequently, but we do see patients who have undergone open heart surgery that come back that aren't quite the same. And so this issue may very well be an issue for TAVI in the future. Conduction issues are something that we haven't overcome yet. It still is an issue. This relates to the proximity of the conducting system of the heart to the virtual annulus where the valve is implanted. You can see the left bundle here and you can see the base of this self-expanding valve. Pacemaker rates, 10% at, at best. I mean, some people report 5%, but they're still up there. Left bundle branch, new onset left bundle branch block is still uh, problematic. More problem with mechanically expanded valves and self-expanding valves than balloon expandable valves. And clearly, whilst it may be protective in older patients and not so much an issue in, in, in the patients we've been treating to date, in younger patients, the, their life expectancy will render them at exposed risk for infection, left and right ventricular dysfunction, and tricuspid valve pathology with the valve being splinted open. One thing that we haven't talked about, and I'd like to just spend a minute or so talking about, is coronary access. We know that aortic stenosis coexists with coronary disease. As patients live longer, their quality of life is improved with 
uh, relieving the aortic stenosis, these patients will present into the future with uh, aortic, um, with coronary disease. And they're likely to present to non-TEVI centres with non-TEVI operators performing angiography. You can see the basal plane here, and in yellow is the average, the median height of the coronary ostia. And these devices can override the coronary ostia, making access during angiography technically uh, challenging. Whilst they don't have an impact on, on the flow down the arteries, they certainly make access challenging. And this is a real problem, and the different devices have variable degrees of coronary uh, covering, and it's something that companies uh, are developing, uh, valves that are more accessible, uh, and also we as operators need to think about how we implant our valves to allow future access. Darren touched on durability. Um, Raj Macker and colleagues in the Portico IDE trial reported um, leaflet attenuation and subclinical leaflet thrombosis with the Portico valve, but this is a phenomenon seen across all platforms, including surgical valves, resolves with, with intense anticoagulation, and hasn't really had a clinical impact. Longevity, valve longevity remains to be seen. Once these longer trials report, we'll know how long they last. The failure for bioprosthetic valves is roughly 7 to 11 years. If you look at actuarial data from the US, a patient who is 75 years old will live 13 years. Someone who's 85 is going to live 7 years. One has to think about longevity in the context of life expectancy. Uh, there is no reason to expect that bioprosthetic valves, uh, TAVI bioprosthetic valves, will fail earlier, but we still need to wait and see. So to conclude, uh, Mr. Chairman, TAVI is now the standard of care for patients with high-risk severe aortic stenosis. There's equivalence in the intermediate-risk uh, patients. There's been sufficient development in technology and implantation technique uh, to ask the question whether TAVI has a role in low-risk um, patients and clinical trials will uh, determine this shortly. Thank you. Thank you very much.